up is part five of the doll's house issue number 14 of the sandman so what did you think about this this is a convention uh, being held at a motel of serial killers it's very creepy because obviously they're serial killers and the the title collectors is a reference to them collecting victims collecting body parts uh, and so on but it's also very funny because i think like Gaiman sort of mines this situation for this this dark humor. So you've got serial killers saying uh, stuff like I could murder a good steak or uh, this chocolate fudge whip is to die for and that's this running gag all through the beginning yeah, of the Yeah, it's, it's just full of those kind of puns. Yeah. I mean, they're talking about uh, the TV adaptation butchering it, but you can find it uncut in Canada. <laughs> and I think that what it's doing over there is sort of showing you a very blase, everyday kind of, uh, you know, because they're not actually talking about killing. No. They're, they're, they, it's just those words have all this double meaning because they're serial killers and because you would normally use this language for the other things they do. And this is also at the same time, I think, commenting on the violence in our everyday language where we use these words, you know, this is how we talk. So taking all of these serial killers and putting them into, you know, what looks like a sales conference you know, something that you would have that is is normalizing or making a very humdrum something so horrific. Uh, whereas it's also saying that our normal humdrum language is actually quite horrific. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's sort of again bleeding, uh, not bleeding. <laughs> 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 it's it's blurring the lines between what is horrible and what is normal in 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 a very different way. In uh, an extremely mundane setting, right? Yeah, I thought that was like a really nice inversion of that that uh, pre presentation of horror, where um, it's just it's so funny that you've got this guy with his clipboard and he's checking off names and he's trying to see who's checked in and who hasn't. So the the very strangely everyday nature of this was was really well done. This is a really good piece of storytelling for me because you've got again a story within a story with that original red riding hood the yes. horrible kind of sense of it we know the horrible stuff that's happened to jed uh, in the story before we know about the violence that's happened over there we also know the corinthian is coming to this because this very convention because yeah. he was talking to nimrod who's the organizer over here in the previous issue yeah so we know he's headed over here we also know he's picked jed up and we know that Gilbert and Rose are stuck over here as well. And so this is now coming to a boil. Uh, and we as the readers are the only people who have all the information on all sides of things. Not even uh, not even Morpheus knows no. uh, all, all aspects of this. And the funny thing is, despite that incredible tension that's created by the fact that we're the only ones in the know, there is still, there is still time to appreciate the details like um, the different panel discussions that the, the serial killers are going to and the fact that their keynote speaker hasn't arrived, so they've got to get the Corinthian to do that stuff. Or the fact that Nimrod is uh, suddenly struck by stage fright. So that juxtaposition of these these very strangely boring and um, everyday kind of things against the the like visceral horror of what these guys do is so um appealing but just when we are thinking that this is going to be all just a series of jokes and puns of how normal uh, these guys are when they're not killing or collecting we've got two different things happening we've got flay by night coming to the Corinthian saying, this guy who's saying he's the boogeyman is not. He's an imposter, so he's an editor of a magazine who wants a story, and they get Nimrod in on the, on the action. And then you've got Funland, who gets obsessed with Rose Walker. Yeah. So you've got these two parallel bits of violence that are sort of just building. But before the assault on Rose, you have Gilbert, who has recognized the Corinthian, and tells Rose that if she's in trouble, he he writes uh, he writes something on a bit of paper and gives it to her and says, "If you're in trouble, say this name." And I have to say, I guessed what the name was. Well. <laughs>
And that's when you have that encounter between Funland and Rose. And until this point, Funland has come across as a fairly benign sort of serial killer, you know. And then when you have this moment with him and Rose in this room and he attacks Rose, and there's a little callback to the Red Riding Hood story that Gilbert tells Rose, when Funland says, well, you can take the dress off, you won't need it anymore, which is exactly what you the wolf said. You throw it in the fire. Yeah. yeah. And that's the wolf aspect. And we've seen a little glimmer I think of Funland because when he snaps at Nimrod you know and when he's had these reactions before mm. where they've been just sort of momentary things and I think that's where even with the art you know it comes across as uh, not as sophisticated as modern day comic book mm. art but even there the use of color where suddenly it becomes like this sort of red panel and it's it's sort of this anger that bubbles up in him so you can understand that even though he comes across as a simpleton and a person who won't swear and uh, there's something underneath that surface, obviously, if he's at this convention, mm. uh, which has been hinted at, and then it erupts over here when its fascination with Rose manifests itself in this attack. Of course, Rose manages to say the name... Morpheus. Morpheus. Uh, he appears, which... I mean... I guess I understand it, but I still don't, you know, I'm like, he's not really a genie. I mean, does he really, <laughs> <laughs> he's not a candy man. I mean, like, is he supposed to just show up if, uh, if people call his name or is, is that something, um, is that something different? I'm not sure, but he does, he does show up and saves her and he traps, uh, Funland in, in in a particular dream where he's he's reunited with his victims I think in a in a sort of weird version of um, the Oscar Wilde story the selfish giant yes it's exactly that's what it's just like all these kids and they're like okay it's all right now and now you're over here right? yeah. you know? and so he's he's obviously you know and and, and we've seen uh, uh, Morpheus do this a couple of times now even um, uh, Roderick Burgess's uh, uh, son was trapped in that endless waking, you oh, know, yeah. of like that, that, that dream uh, sort of thing. And we'll see what happens with all of the serial killers. Okay, so he shows up and he saves Rose Walker. Uh, I'm not really sure why, maybe because she's the vortex, but I don't know. I mean, Gilbert doesn't know that she's a vortex yet. That's a good point. It didn't occur to me to question that, honestly. I just thought, oh, well, I guess she says his name and he comes out and he saves her. I'm not even sure if uh, Dream was on his way here already. I'm, I'm sure he can travel a lot faster than people in a car, but he does find the Corinthian, he encounters, he destroys the Corinthian, and then he punishes all of these serial killers. He leaves these guys with the, the the notion of what they've done, the fact that they are actually petty, they're not as grand, mm. which is which is what the story has been showing us from the very beginning, yeah. that it's all very mundane yeah. and it's all very humdrum. And so in spite of whatever they think of themselves, in spite of all of that, uh, he puts them into that. And then of course, Gilbert shows up with Jed, Jed. who was in the trunk of the Corinthians car. So uh, again, I'm not really sure why Jed is still alive and uh, why the Corinthian didn't kill him. Uh, when he picked him up on the road. Those are the two parts of this story, which I think is uh, excellent. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's scary, it's creepy, it's funny. Uh, it really expands the world uh, uh, up to up to this point of time, uh, giving us more entities, giving us, you know, Hob Gadling is a fantastic story, all of these things. But just why does Morpheus show up mm. uh, when Rose Walker uh, has his name? Why once Jed uh, is freed uh, or escapes from his uncle and aunt, why does he get picked up by the Corinthian? Why doesn't he get killed by the Corinthian? And he just hangs out until Gilbert now comes back. And then where did Gilbert disappear to? Th those are the kind of storytelling coincidences or twists that maybe our viewers can illuminate me on something that I'm missing. But those are very small things, I think, really, given uh, the rest of the story, to bring us to one kind of end, which is the end of the serial killers, the Corinthian uh, and Rose Walker finding Jed. Jed. But that's not the end of the doll's house because there are two more issues after this, part six and seven, which I think are very different from what's come before. So it's almost uh, like we can take 
all of these issues, except for the men of good fortune, as being the sort of quest of Rose Walker trying to find Jed, understanding what Unity Kincaid uh, wants them for, who she is as a vortex. But the resolution of the vortex thing, these last two issues, I think are very different in tone and very different in approach and also very different in uh, storytelling style. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, until this point, it's very sort of narratively powerfully driven. But the last two issues, there's a lot more sort of philosophizing, which I'm quite interested in. All right. So let's take a look then at Doll's House Part 6, mm. which was issue number 15 of The Sandman. This part is called Into the Night and it deals mainly with Rose Walker being the vortex. She's kind of again in a holding pattern so they were stuck in one place uh, at one point of time and they were stuck in the hotel in Florida and now she's stuck over here waiting for Jed's recovery yeah. and for her mother to join us. So what did you think of this chapter? It's a little strange, it's a little weird, isn't it? It is a little weird but I think that that's sort of par for the course once you understand what's happening which is that she's in this moment of stress she's suddenly sort of activated whatever uh, being a vortex means which in this case is her being able to look in on other people's dreams and then trying to meld them all together so i i really liked how um you can see the different art styles so each each person's dream world is represented differently it's very atmospheric you know, in the way that, that my dreams would probably not look very much like your dreams. So I think that was a great representation. Yeah, you get to see the people uh, as they are, as they are really, irrespective of how they show. So like Ken and Barbie, for example, they may look like uh, two peas in a pod as far as their yuppie-ish uh, behavior mm. and appearance is concerned, mm. but their dreams are so very different. So, you know, Ken's got this like stark mechanical money power and yeah. Barbie's got this rich fantasy kind of uh, fantasy creature, Martin Tenbones. I mean, like the contrast over here is far greater a contrast than the two blonde yuppie people we've been seeing together. And you're right, the art styles are incredible. And I think this is one of the most um, ambitious kind of issues, uh, especially from the point of view of comics storytelling, because mm. it's, uh, I mean, all of it's been very ambitious, you know, because you're trying to talk about dreams, but over here, you're actually showing seven different or six different sets of dreams yeah. in completely different styles, in completely different writing uh, styles. In the lettering, art, yeah. And the lettering, yes. This is where I think Todd Klein's lettering, which has been fantastic throughout, gets a fantastic showcase. I mean, I think uh, issue 15 uh, might be one of the most ambitiously lettered and the most uh, crazily lettered uh, issues in the entire series. And you've got this sense of how crucial dreams are to people's identities. So you learn a bit more about Chantal and Zelda, the spider, stuffed spider collecting ladies, and how they've got all of these issues with who they are and uh, demons from their past that they're trying to deal with in their dreams, which I'm sure is similar to what is going on in Ken and Barbie's dreams. And I feel like that builds on the themes of the first uh, volume, which, which is all about how powerful human beings' dreams can be. And then you've got Morpheus, who is looking at this, and then the walls between these dreams start collapsing. And so you've got, again, the layout. You had one side of the page for Ken's dream and one side of the page for Barbie's dream. Suddenly, both of them mm. are on the same page. You've got Chantal and Zelda's dreams occurring in the same page. And then you've suddenly got a lot of panels where every single dream is right next to mm. each other. And then the double page spread of the vortex in which everything is swirling around and then you've got to read the page again, you know, so, some, sometimes like this, sometimes like this, yeah. because it's going around in a circle and that's what Morpheus senses, the, the, the sort of dissolving of the boundaries and how this can be a disastrous thing. And that's another thing that I was a little confused by, uh, and again on my reread, where it seems that it happens once an era. There mm -hmm. is a vortex in every era. But right at the beginning, I think uh, he says the first vortex of our era. I was a little confused about whether there is a vortex in every era. And this is beside, you know, what is an era. But, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, is there a vortex in every era? Or are there many vortexes in one era? It might just be a, a, a single thing. But I think for the most, 
It's like every era has a vortex. Mm. And now we're seeing the activation, as you say, of this vortex. So he comes and he gets her, which is, he had her before. Yeah, he and he let her go at that point. So I was just wondering about that. Why, why didn't he address um, her nature as a vortex when he had her in the motel? Why did he wait until now? He's like, you've suffered enough or something yeah, like that. Yeah, he says, I would not see you troubled anymore or right. something like that. So, um... Except when he now picks her up and says, now I've got to kill you. Yeah, so I was wondering whether, like, there was some sort of trigger that he only needed to kill her when she activated as a vortex. So maybe it's that. Yeah, it is, uh, it is said in this issue that every single vortex is dealt with by him killing them. Yes. He has to kill their human form yeah. and then the vortex ceases to exist. So why he didn't choose to do that when that's the way he's always dealt with it uh, back at the motel when he had her, maybe he had bigger fish to fry with the Corinthian at that point of time. Yeah, that's how I explained it to myself. Although dealing with the Corinthian was <laughs> as about as much effort as it took him to deal with Hector. You know, he was like, <laughs> all right, you're done, you know, and you're just disintegrated right now. It wasn't really a huge battle or a no, fight or something like that. No, in fact, like the Corinthian that. proposes a battle and like, yeah, I'm not gonna do that. So I don't really know why he didn't take care of Rose at that point mm. of time. But now is when he decides to do that. But uh, Gilbert is informed by... Matthew the Raven. Matthew the Raven that that's what's going to happen. And Gilbert's like, I'm going to put a stop to this. Yeah. So that's where we end the second to last issue. Uh, heading into the concluding part of The Doll's House. Which is issue number 16 of The Sandman. This is the last chapter and it takes place almost entirely in the dreamscape with Rose, Walker and Morpheus having this conversation in which he says, I have to kill you because you're the vortex and you will destroy everything. I, I feel like I really warmed to Rose during this conversation because I like how Yet again, she's a female character who is who's who's talking back to Morpheus and who's like, well, you know, what does that mean? Why why does the fact that I'm a vortex mean you just have to kill me? Yes, and I think this is a really good thing about the series that although it is high fantasy and you know really epic fantasy where you're talking about dreams and eternal creatures and dimensions and things like that, the way that these conversations go are not wooden and stolid. You know, they really crackle because. You've got real debate, you've got real mm. argument, you've got point and counterpoint, whether it's, you know, uh, Death talking to Dream or whether it's Rose talking to Dream or uh, Matthew uh, having a conversation with Gilbert. Uh, all of these things, they, they all have a lot of potency. They all seem to have a lot to argue. Uh, yeah. which which as a reader is really entertaining because you're not just hearing someone talk about a prophecy yeah. and someone accepting it or someone resisting it in very base terms or in very cliche terms. This notion of death, of destruction, of, of, of what it means, uh, all of these things are, are uh, they, they could be quite difficult uh, to relate to. I think I can get bored with these things very easily, you know. So the fact that it's exciting, the fact that it's dangerous, the fact that there are moral or ethical or um, interesting conundrums in which people are trying to argue one point over the other mm. um, really elevate uh, the writing in this series uh, beyond what fantasy usually is. So what did you think of this chapter? This is, of course, where it is uh, conclusively revealed that Gilbert is... Fiddler's Green. Which is something that you apparently knew from the second chapter I onwards. I, I remember being very satisfied with that, going, ah, oh, of course. Yeah. You know, and it's like, oh, that makes complete sense. But also the fact that this character that we've been seeing all this while is that dream entity who escaped that we heard about and was never a person to begin with, mm. but was a place and was such an important and such key place in the dreaming. It's the kind of stuff that I love the most about fantasy, where it just completely expands yeah. your definitions of what characters are, or what situations are, or what realities are. It expands what your idea of what is possible, and I love that about fantasy too. This was a it was a it was a very satisfying conclusion, I think, overall as an issue, because you've got 
you've got this sense of like you were saying um people pushing and pulling against what is seen as possible in this world so you've got dream with this single minded approach to oh you're a vortex you're going to have to die and that's that but you've got rose questioning that you've got fiddler's green coming onto the scene saying i will give up my existence for hers and then of course you've got the person who does succeed unity team kid who says well here's a thing dream i was supposed to be the vortex so why don't you let my granddaughter go you have on one side a victory in this debate you know someone scores a point yes. on on dream yeah. uh, they get it across but you also have dream accepting it yeah. where he says all right yeah that makes sense so it is satisfying you know it feels it feels uh, properly earned because the pieces have been put into place so carefully and so well and at the same time it also feels uh, um emotional because you've got Miranda by Unity's bedside uh, a mother she never knew a mother she never got to spend any time with and you do feel that grief you do yeah. feel that loss you do feel um this ripping out of the heart and that's a nice little callback to the prologue story uh, yes. with the with the the shards of glass in the desert and of course you've got these questions uh, that you're left with at the end of it what did you think about the absolute end of the story even when i was going through this this volume a second time in preparation for making this video and having this conversation i was thinking about what um what the conversation especially that uh rose is sort of having with herself in her diary so you've got her questioning um her position in this world as being the plaything of something that's immortal which is you know dream but you've also got dream's conversation with desire where he inverts that and he says we're their playthings it's not that mortals are our playthings we are the ones who are their dolls so i'm still a little confused about that i'm not sure what he means by the endless being the playthings of mortals because clearly mortals don't have that much power <laughs> Well, in another way you could look at these creatures, these endless, these entities uh deriving all of their meaning. I mean, dreams uh or desires, etc. are born of us, are born of human ah. beings. So therefore, no matter how powerful they are, they wouldn't exist without humans. But you're right, I do also feel that way especially because this is another one of those things is like What are you talking about Marcius? You've not behaved as if you're the plaything of yes. these human beings at any point of time. You're like your child is my child and I will come exactly. back and take this child and you're very pompous and you're like how dare you think I need companionship and you're like okay hop gadling like, you're my friend. <laughs> and, you know it's like but maybe maybe what we're seeing over here and maybe that's what the doll's house storyline is about it really starts from issue number 8 from the sound of her mm. wings where he's depressed like what comes next etc and death uh, is the one who says this is this is what there is you know all of this all of humanity all of the beauty of humanity all of the life that's what everything is about so maybe this is a journey for him uh, maybe this is a oh. journey on which he realizes this so maybe he doesn't behave that way throughout the story he definitely did not behave that way with nada no but he learned something from nada maybe he's not talking about something where he believes or he has believed this all through his existence maybe it's something that's a realization that's coming to him now that maybe we exist more for them than they exist for us right and it does come across as a little okay you just realize this don't go and tell your sister brother as if you've known this <laughs> um, uh, yeah friend. i mean i feel like desire and i are both the same level of unconvinced at the end <laughs> we're like what do you mean i'm no plaything but but he also confronts desire which she's the person who got unity kinkade pregnant she's rose's grandfather or grandmother yeah what what did you get from that what did you get was trying to be done over there well there's an explanation that dream gives which is that by virtue of rose being the vortex he would have had to kill her but because rose is also desire's grandchild um she's then a relative of morpheus's and so um he would have ended up killing someone that he was related to which is uh, a big no so desire impregnating unity and making the vortex pass down is desire's plot to try to destroy dream, dream. which obviously she's tried before and failed so it's just a game it's a game that desire and maybe despair are playing 
trying to destroy Dream, but he, he sees through that. Yeah. But it's just, he came pretty close because he was about to destroy her. I think because of the way he speaks and because of the way he presents himself, Morpheus comes across as this all-knowing, all-powerful person, but he's not all-powerful and all-knowing at no. least. He's realizing or learning things. I mean, the gap between him confronting her and Unity taking her place is just of a few pages. Yes. And at that point of time, he didn't know that uh, that Rose was his kin. Yeah. What I like about this is that if Dream had been infallible, if he had been all-knowing, if he had been just always in control, even if he was aloof, it would have been extremely boring. Mm -hmm. But the <laughs> fact that he is just learning these things and then pretending like he knew it all along or he's got it under control uh, is what makes it so fascinating for me. Again, it's like one of those things where you can have all this epicness and all this high fantasy, but it's also being punctured. Yeah, and, and that's what makes, makes Dream an interesting character as well. I would think that he's not just this infallible god. He is capable of making mistakes and also trying to cover them up. But that's also why I think what he says to her at the end doesn't really um, get through to her, just the way that it didn't convince <laughs> you. She's like, what are you talking about? It's like, I'm desired. Human beings are my puppets. So she's got her own doll's house. You've got the start of it. If you leave out the prologue, mm. it starts with the desires, you know, that body yeah. that is desires palace and it ends with Desire's palace. So those are the bookends for the story and Desire is not at all convinced. It's just like, well, curses foiled again. I'm gonna have yeah. to try, I'm gonna have to try something else. You've got these endless, they're not gods, but how are they going to keep themselves entertained? Exactly. So you had Dream who was all mopey and gloomy of like what comes next, and now you've got Desire who's like, Oh, I've got to I've got to do something about this, which is I think what the Yeah, I mean I, I, I'm pretty sure that Desire is gonna turn up again with another plot to try and topple her elder siblings. Um so I'm interested in seeing how how that goes. <laughs> So would you say that you enjoyed the second volume of The Sandman more than you did the first? Absolutely, by quite a lot. I think it helps to already have the the, the world sort of set up in the first volume. And I think this is something that I've seen with, um, with other fantasy series that I read as well. The first one is always a little slow to get going. But in this one, you get right into the story. You have that expansion of the world, which is always very pleasurable for a reader. And the storytelling itself, I think, was a lot um, stronger. Yeah, I agree with you. And I also think that in some ways you can sort of dispense with the first volume because the second volume was the first one that was collected. So although mm. people were reading the single issues from uh, issue number one, the first volume to be published in a collected trade paperback was The Doll's House. It started with The Sound of Her Wings. And if you don't know about the sleeping sickness, it doesn't matter. I mean, Unity says, you know, I was asleep for a while, yeah. you know, she could have been in a coma and, and and everything else, you know, as far as the endless, as far as the siblings, all of the things are there in this story. Yeah. And it's a much larger story. So yeah, I think it is possible to start from volume two, not read volume one at all. Also because it feels properly epic in the way that it's giving me things that I've never seen before. These things about the dream realms and about the vortex, as opposed to something of where someone's trying to recover four items that were taken the from quest them and the quest and yeah. etc. Which, which as, as, as great as it is, uh, is still something you've seen before. Yeah. Whereas I think with A Doll's House, we get to things that I hadn't seen before. And I found to be really original, really smart, really interesting with a couple of those storytelling uh, questions that I yeah. still seem to have. Yeah, and I, I, to me, I think the story moves at such a clip and cuts between the different threads so well that I honestly forgave any mistakes or holes that there may have been. I just sort of went with the story because it was so gripping. And one final question that I know that the art of the Sandman is often off-putting to people. It doesn't look very content temporary, a lot of it is affected by printing capabilities of the time, but it also has a very different type of artistic uh, vision. It's not about presenting things the way Superman or Batman, etc. were drawn. It's not colored that way. It's not uh, composed in that way. Did you find that to be a problem while reading a doll's house? Not as much as I did when I read Preludes and Nocturnes because I remember even in the conversation we had at that time I said that it was really um, 
icky that the art was not it was too garish it was too lurid i didn't enjoy that and i had to get over that to get to the story but in this one for one thing i kind of knew what i was in for so i i tried to ignore any parts of the art that irritated me but i feel like the writing was so good and the storytelling was so strong that i didn't really bother too much about the art at all which is i know kind of a cardinal sin in reading comics but well i mean um, to me it's like i think the art is very different i don't think it's as cartoony hmm. uh, uh, grotesque as it was so i find it to be the 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 shapes may not be accurate but hmm. they're very moody hmm. i like the colors i like the shadows i like the layout especially oh, i think yeah. the composition yeah. the way that uh, things change around and again it's very unique it's unlike other comics and especially when i first read it it was unlike any other comic that i read especially a comic from dc i can't think of the sandman in this volume uh, even with its uh, faults hmm. i can't think of it having different art because it works with the writing so well and it blends together so well that it really is quite nightmarish when it wants to be nightmarish and deeply philosophical and beautiful when it wants to be that way not because the picture you're looking at is beautifully colored but because the ethereal nature is being yeah. put across uh, so well so i hope that your good experience with volume 2 means that you'll get to volume 3 a lot faster than you did get to volume 2 so i think i might get right to it because i'm i'm interested in seeing where the story goes um and i hope you enjoyed this episode thank you as always for watching this has been for the love of comics and i'll see you at the next video